So this will start the lecture for chapter 24. Essentially we'll be talking about how light is going to behave like a wave and kind of explain why we can get these really cool colors on thin films. So we're going to start off by saying um, light is actually going to behave like a wave. It does have some properties that it's going to cause it to behave like a particle. However, in this chapter we're going to focus on the wave nature of light. So we'll start off with um, Huygens' principle, principle that's going to allow us to describe wave fronts and apply that to the law of reflection to get a better understanding of the law of refraction to get a better understanding of that. A couple of experiments to demonstrate the wave nature of light. Talk about the visible spectrum and how we can uh, make light bend. And then we'll take a look at diffraction, diffraction gratings, the spectrometer, spectroscopy, how light can interfere in thin films, and then a really cool little um, device that uses interference. Um, important concept is going to be polarization and how liquid crystal displays work as well as the scattering of light in the atmosphere. Now in the last chapter I typically drew um, light rays as being you know going from one place to the other and f indeed if, if, if this guy was a light bulb, if my source was a light bulb then I would say hey I got light going out in all directions here. However keep in mind that what we're actually talking about is electromagnetic waves. So we're going to be talking about, I'm just going to draw the electric field for a second here, we we'll talking about some electric field that's going up and down. This light is traveling in this direction. So in this chapter, we're actually going to be talking about the wave crests, so that's going to be these blue lines. Kind of picture a source, and we'll just be looking at the location of, or looking at this, this um, crest right here. If this source, we could even think of it as a mechanical wave. Say we just threw a um, stone into a pond, and we're going to see the crests kind of, you know, come outwards away from the source, kind of like that. Now, what Huygens' principle says is we can actually treat any given piece of this wavefront as, a, as an individual source. And that individual source is going to be sending out secondary wavelets um, just, like, um, just as such. So as we slice and dice our wave up into individual pieces, this piece is going to act like a source, this piece is going to act like a source, this piece is going to act like a source, and send out little circles of their own, and these guys are all going to add together pretty much where the next crest is going to be. Huygens' principle may sound um, pretty silly, however it does explain a whole lot of things, including diffraction, which is going to be the bending of light around obstacles. If light behaved like a particle, and it was incident upon, say, just like a, a pier or something like that, then it would really just kind of you know, clip off and it would be totally dark over here. However, what really happens is the light tends to go around an obstacle, say a sharp edge, and it tends to fill in back there. What Huygens' principle says is we're going to treat each one of these, you know, slice and dice this wave front up into individual chunks, and they're going to behave like point sources. And so the waves are going to kind of fill, fill in back here. And so we can get a little bit of light um, behind a solid obstacle. Again, keep in mind that these are wave crests. And this is the direction of travel here in, um, in, here in magenta. Now, if we were to, say, look at you know, two piers, then what's going to happen is it's going to fill in over here as such. And this really does explain the wave nature of light. As we actually make this slit smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, it's actually going to say we're, we're, we just have one individual chunk here. It's going to be just like a rock dropped into the water, and it's going to behave just like a point source. Now, one thing I didn't mention is that, the, that these rays must always be perpendicular to the wavefront. So you can kind of see the wavefront here. The rays must always be perpendicular to it. Huygens' principle can also explain the law of refraction that we saw in the last chapter. Suppose we're going from a relatively fast medium to a relatively slow medium, so perhaps we have air up here and water down here, then what Huygens' principle says is, hey, we can take these um, wave, wave fronts and, and divvy them up into their own individual um, wavelets, behaving like a point source. So point A is going to behave like a point source, but it's going into the relatively slower medium. Compare that to point B right here, it's in a much faster medium. So what, what we have kind of have, have here is we, we're going to have one, a different wavelength. You can kind of see this distance right here from wavefront to wavefront. That wavelength up here is going to be very, very different in this, wave, um, in, th in this wavelength. But also you can kind of see that this is going to behave kind of like a, more, more like a chain than a 2x4, if you think about the wavefront. 
going to slow down over here and as the wave front enters more and more and more of it enters the water then we're going to essentially be able to build it and we draw our ray perpendicular to that wave front and you can kind of see that yes the, it must indeed bend inwards here you can kind of liken this to driving um, driving your car down the road and there's a puddle just on one side of the road what you're going to feel is you're going to feel the wheel being jerked towards the puddle as you dr drive through the puddle kind of what's going on there is the wheels in the water are going to be going slower than the wheels that are on the dry pavement something to kind of keep in mind is is the frequency of the wave in medium one must be equal to the frequency of the wave in medium number two however the wavelength and the speed are going to be very different so frequency one must be equal to frequency two however they're going to have different wavelengths and different speeds this slide right here just gives you the kind of the text of everything that I um, said in the last slide it's very, it's very, very, very important to remember that the frequency of the light is not going to change as we go into new mediums. The frequency in the first medium must be equal to the frequency in the second medium. Now, the frequency is related to how fast the electrons are wiggling back and forth, and obviously it must be the same whether we're in the medium or outside of the medium. You can kind of think of it as, you know, waves crashing onto the shore. If it's happening one times a second, a second then it's always going to be one times a second. We're not going to be able to change the frequency of the waves. Once they land upon the shore, then they can slow down, but the frequency has got to be the same. Because the frequency has got to be, be the same, what we can kind of do is we can relate the wavelength to the speed, so the ratio of the wavelength to the ratio of the speeds, which is also related to the indices of refraction, remember the speed of light divided by um, the relative velocity. So this expression right here allows us to relate the wavelength to the indices of refraction in two different mediums. So very important to be able to use that. If one of those um, indices happens to be air, say n is equal to 1, then we could kind of write the um, index of refraction, or the, write the wavelength in the new material as just the original wavelength divided by the in material's indices of refraction. However, this one tends to be more useful. Just kind of a sidebar, we don't um, have to have a sharp um, change. We can ha also have gradual changes in, in index of refraction. Essentially, if you you know look down a lonely highway on a hot hot summer day, what's happening is is the pavement is really 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 hot. The air right here, therefore, is really 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 hot. Up here, it's going to be relatively cold. So it's going to be hotter. Different different density here than than here. Different indices of refraction. And so you know some light rays might be unbent. But as the light rays get closer and closer and closer to the ground, they're going to bend. And since we tend to see only in straight lines, you're going to see the top of the car um, essentially right over here. So an English scientist um, named Thomas Young said, if light really is a wave, then we should see um, some, some interference effect. We should be able to see, if you remember from chapters um, 11 and 12, uh, if we had two waves and they were in phase with one another, then they should add together and we should get a much much, we should get a much larger wave. If we had two waves that were 180 degrees out of phase, so take that wave plus that way, then we should just get a straight line. So one way to do this is to have a double slit experiment where we have some light, light incident upon two slits. These two slits are going to act like individual sources and we should see some constructive interference right there and we should see destructive interference. So what we're actually going to see is are some bright bands there, 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 and there. That's where constructive interference is going to occur, so this this one. And then we're going to see some dark bands here, 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 and here. That's where destructive interference is going to occur. So this is just kind of showing a, a, a top view of this double slit experiment where we're going to have some wave fronts, you know, incident upon two slits. And we apply Huygens principle and say we're going to treat that slit like a point source and this slit like a point source then where these two wave fronts are going to add up, we're going to have constructive interference. And you can kind of see that right here, we're going to have constructive interference. We expect to see a bright spot. This is also going to occur at other locations up and down the screen. Kind of the key to understanding this interference is taking a look at the distance that these light, light rays must um, travel from the sli slits. If you kind of take a look at uh, just the, the center po point, you can kind of convince yourself that the bottom one and the top one 
have um, traveled the same distance. They were initially in phase, and so they're going to interfere constructively. We, we have the crest lining up with the crest, and we expect to see constructive interference, or we expect to see a bright spot. Now, if you take a look at um, the, the um, B right here, you can see that there's some extra distance covered by the bottom one compared to the top one. If that path length, dif path length difference is equal to an integer multiple of the wavelength, then they are still going to line up crest to crest, and we're going to have bright spots. If that path length di difference is one half of, wa of wavelength, then they're going to line up crest to trough, and we're going to get destructive interference or a dark spot. Now, kind of the geometry is shown right over here, where we have a triangle right here, and we can relate the path length difference to the separation distance between the slits and the angle that the light is going to make to be incident upon the screen. So this slide kind of sums up everything I said on the last slide. When we take a look at this path length difference, is when that is an integer multiple of the wavelength, then we're going to get bright, bright spots, constructive interference, where it's going to happen many times. It's going to happen where, when m is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on and so on and so on and so forth. Now the path length difference, that's going to be essentially related to the separation of the slits multiplied by the sine of the angle, which really kind of tells you, you know, wh where you're looking at on the screen. When the path length difference is um, an integer multiple of a half, then we're going to get dark spots because we're lining up crests to troughs. Up here, we're lining up um, crests to crests. Um, I would definitely, you know, su superstar this slide, you're going to be using it quite a bit. Something that's really kind of cool is we can actually separate out the colors. If you kind of say, this is going to be my distance away from the screen, so here I'm increasing my y distance, it would also be increasing my angle, therefore increasing sine theta. Because white light is actually comprised of, of uh, many different colors, then we would expect that the angle to depend totally on the wavelength, since I'm holding the separation distance between the slits constant, and m is just a number. So we would expect to see a, a smearing out of the colors, starting with the um, violets, the blues, working their way up to the um, higher wavelengths, to the reds. Since we're going to be talking about visible light for uh, just a little bit, I'm going to remind you a little bit from chapter 22. The visible spectrum that we see is just a tiny, tiny, tiny little sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum. The wavelengths of visible light can be around 400 to 750 nanometers, and we could very easily convert that to frequency by saying that the um, frequency multiplied by the wavelength must be equal to the speed of light. So we could very easily convert 400 nanometers into frequency. Short wavelengths tend to be um, blue. Long wavelengths tend to be red. If you go shorter than blue, or shorter than violet, you're going to get ultraviolet, or UV light, the type that gives you sunburn. If we go longer than red, we get the infrared. Now I've kind of shown you how we can separate out white light into the various color colors using um, a double split. Uh, double slit experiment. Now now let's come back and talk about something we um, covered in chapter 23, which deals with the index of refraction. Dispersion is, is when we take white light and we separate it out into colors. Something I didn't tell you in the previous chapter is that the index of refraction is actually going to vary slightly with the wavelength of the light. So if I looked at the refractive index as a function of wavelength, you can kind of see that you know depending on the material, it's going to be very, very different for um, different colors. So taking a look at um, you know, the flint glass right here, index refra refraction for the blue light is going to be very different than the index refraction of the red light. So they're traveling at different speeds. What this kind of means is if we take some white light, which is going to be you know, all the colors of the rainbow, essentially, then they're going to, uh, you know, over, um, they're going to uh, follow Snell's law. N1 sine theta 1 is going to be equal to N2 sine theta 2, but now the index of refraction right here is going to be different for the different colors. So that's going to cause the red light to come out at a different angle than the blue light, and going to separate the colors out, um, essentially cause them to spread out. Again, that's called dispersion. And you should, at the end of the day, be able to see a nice you know, Roy G. Biv of the color spectrum, so kind of what you would expect to see in the rainbow. Now it turns out this is actually how we see rainbows. We're going to you know, have some rain, some um, droplets of water, and we have some sunlight coming in, sunlight being white light. Red light's going to bend differently than the violet light. 
as we as it goes through the, through the droplet and you can kind of see right here that the violet light is going to miss my observer it's going to go you know in this direction right here however the red light do, is able to enter the uh, subject's eyeball a little bit lower down a um, little bit lower down the sky we're going to have another rain, raindrop this one's going to be bad for the red light the red light's going to miss the observer however the violet light is going to go into the observer and you can kind of picture yourself, you know, in between I'm going to have all these various different droplets that are going to correspond to all the various different colors between the violet and the red. What it all boils down to is dispersion, spreading out the um, colors of white light.